What's up? In this video, we are going to be watching a documentary about economic racism in the cannabis industry. I guess you can call it economic prejudice or basically blocking the middle class and lower class of the economic tiers of individuals in America out of the cannabis industry. So let's get into this. In the heart of Maryland, the free state, a battle rages in the cannabis industry, a battle for freedom, for fairness, and for the future. Welcome to a world of contracts, where the promise of a budding industry collides head on with a shadowy, relentless, monopolistic force. Country, we have a civil war going on between the hemp industry and the cannabis industry. This civil war is not beneficial to public interest whatsoever. They failed at every turn to discredit us and took zero opportunities to argue anything factual in their defense. The Maryland Hemp Coalition is suing the state, arguing Maryland is monopolizing the marijuana licensing industry and therefore hurting hemp businesses. In the face of the booming cannabis and hemp industries, a storm was brewing one of power struggles, monopolies, corruption, and injustice. It has come to my attention that there are some people in this room working on behalf of the cannabis establishment that have been using political influence to mislead the legislature by spreading misinformation about our industry on behalf of their clients with a competing economic interest. It's exactly what the state wants. They see an industry, they know there's a lot of money involved, and they want to step into the shoes of the cartel. Who do you think kept people interested in cannabis while the state was busy locking people up for it? It was us. Young argues politics and money played a role when crafting pot policy. As soon as a lot of money gets on the table, elected officials seem to forget about those basic principles. But this is more than just a battle for the cannabis industry. It's a fight for fundamental rights, for social and economic equity, and for the spirit of free enterprise. How do you put me out of business and call it social equity? He got a $6,000 donation. Wilson got another $1,000 donation. Atterbury getting a $1,000 donation on January 5th. Hayes getting $2,500 from Van Wingerden on January 2nd, too. But it's not just legislators. Governor Wes Moore got a $6,000 check from SunMed on January 5th. The week So basically, yeah, people are getting paid off to help these corporations monopolize the industry by making the licensing costs outrageous. So yeah, this is the economic racism I was talking about. They're basically being racist against people who don't have millions of dollars. You know, like if you don't have a million and a half in the bank, you won't qualify for a cannabis license in Maryland. Before session began, with all this money flowing to the lawmakers, Patrick and hemp grower Levi Sellers say their business could dry up. And it's not an accident. But I believe the cannabis industry um, is trying to consolidate and monopolize the market. As voices rise and alliances form, the stage is set for an epic struggle, one that will shape the destiny of an entire industry. We are concerned about things that get you high and you can walk to Main Street and buy some right after this hearing. Behind me today, you will see many people that are here in support of our industry. Please look at them. These are the men and women whose livelihoods this bill as written will destroy. Buckle up as we delve into the heart of the battle where passion meets policy and the fight for free markets becomes a war for justice. Witness the clash between power and principle, the resilience of the human spirit, and the relentless pursuit of a dream, the dream of a truly free cannabis industry. This is the untold story of Weed War, Maryland Monopoly, and the fight for free markets. When the news breaks that cannabis is legal, many will imagine a world transformed where vibrant, accessible markets thrive akin to any other industry. But yet, as we peel back the layers, Maryland's reality presents a stark contrast to these expectations. Nicholas Patrick is an entrepreneur and an advocate. He is the owner of multiple hemp retail stores and a co-founder of the Maryland Healthy Alternatives Association. He's one of the lead plaintiffs in a lawsuit against the state of Maryland. The lawsuit, which was granted a preliminary injunction on October 12th, alleges that the state of Maryland has created an unjust monopoly under the guise of social equity. He believes we have a long way to go to achieve true freedom in the cannabis industry. I use the term legalization very loosely because it's not legal in the same way that let's say alcohol is legal or cigarettes is legal or any other regulated product is legal. It's restricted in such a way that can only be brought on by an outdated way of thinking, the reefer madness mentality, I call it, where it's ignorance and it's fear that kind of controls the regulatory scheme for cannabis to the point where we're calling something legal that has limits on how much you can purchase, how much you can 
possess, has limits on how much that you can grow. It has limits on the types of varieties of products that'll be sold in, in, in cannabis establishments. There's arbitrary limits on licensing. So it's not really legalized. I think it's just been monetized because if it was truly legal, you'd be able to possess as much of it as you want. There's no caps on how many bottles of alcohol you can buy from the liquor store. And there's no caps on how many packs of cigarettes you can buy from the gas station. But for some reason, you're only allowed to have an ounce and a half of cannabis on you at any time or, or it's a misdemeanor crime. This so-called legal market is but a mirage, a cleverly constructed facade of equity, masking a landscape dominated by corporate interests. Here, residents confront exorbitant prices, limited access to the industry, limited product offerings, and stringent regulations, which all stifle innovation and curtail consumer choice. The existing medical cannabis industry in Maryland really was a limited licensing and really restricted small businesses from operating in that space. The opportunity created by the 2018 Farm Bill was a great advantage to small businesses like ourselves. We had dreams of expanding our operation, offering a diversity of product, but it wasn't until the regulatory changes of the Cannabis Reform Act that really limited our abilities or our potentials to operate in that space. Essentially, there was a monopoly being created by the Cannabis Administration in favor of large corporate cannabis businesses versus the small family-owned and minority-owned businesses currently operating in the hemp space. You only have so many growers in the state and you can only grow so much cannabis that you can only sell so many different strains of cannabis through the dispensary system. You can really only have so much so that you can actually control prices. It's almost like diamonds. You can just trickle it out and control prices like you want. To me, to someone who's been part of this culture, which I think most venture owners are missing, they, they understand the bottom line of cannabis, they understand the business corporate side, but they don't understand the culture and the culture predates legalization, it predates any of these licenses, and it has a stronger voice than you're willing to admit that it has. The state presented their 300 limited licenses or a cap on licensing as being an effort to create public safety. But uh, those numbers, in my opinion, are arbitrary. We have thousands of licenses for alcohol, which is a far more dangerous substance than cannabis. But yet there's thousands of points of retail for alcohol in the state of Maryland. Limiting the license for cannabis only benefits the license holders uh, to have a more valuable license, as well as the state in their ability to drive revenue from the licensing scheme or through taxation of the products. In sharp contrast to the monopolized cannabis industry, the hemp sector has flourished under a free market model. Booming to a staggering $28 billion industry, it has become a beacon of success, driven by thousands of small businesses across the nation. Roughly 30% of these enterprises are minority owned, showcasing an increase inclusive and thriving market. These facts have created the dawn of a civil war in cannabis between big multi-state corporations and the small business driven hemp industry. Levi Sellers is the owner of South Nound Microfarm and Sustained Biosuticals, a hemp farm and product line produced in Western Maryland. He has been a staunch advocate for the rights of hemp businesses since 2018. He is also the president of the Maryland Hemp Coalition and is the governor-appointed hemp industry representative on the Maryland Agriculture Commission. He believes the hemp industry is an outlet for small and minority-owned businesses to have a footprint in the cannabis industry. The 2018 Farm Bill really opened the doors to access for the agricultural community to get into cultivating cannabis. And as defined in the 2018 Farm Bill, hemp is the plant cannabis sativa with a 0.3% Delta 9 THC concentration on a dry weight basis. Having that access for the agricultural community really provided a lot of opportunity to small family owned and minority owned businesses, especially those that were passionate about the cannabis plant and all that it could offer, not just its therapeutic potentials, but also its industrial potentials. And South Mountain Microfarm really jumped at the opportunity to cultivate this wonderful plant because we believe that this was our opportunity to get into the cannabis industry. 2018 Farm Bill is now the law of the land. President Trump signing the bill at a White House ceremony this afternoon, drawing applause from a host of ag industry supporters and lawmakers who helped get the bill passed. In 2018, President Trump signed into law the 2018 Agricultural Improvement Act, otherwise known as the Farm Bill. Trump the Farm made Bill separated legal, brother. hemp from cannabis and legalized hemp at the federal level. Hemp is defined very, very simply. It is any part of the plant cannabis sativa L 
with less than 0.3% Delta 9 THC on a dry weight basis. Any part includes all derivatives, all extracts, all isomers, all salts, all salts of isomers, all acids, all cannabinoids have now become legal so long as the Delta 9 THC concentration is below 0.3% on a dry weight basis. Delta 9 THC is the primary intoxicant found in marijuana. If that's limited down to less than half of 1%, on a dry weight basis, the hemp industry had the doors open to them to be able to create an industry around three tenths of the plant, and that industry has grown into a $28 billion nationwide industry, keeping up now with craft beer, and it's bigger than both adult use and medical cannabis. Nevin Young is an attorney representing the hemp industry in their lawsuit against the state of Maryland. He believes protecting the hemp industry is a matter of economic liberty. I've always been interested in economic liberty issues going way back, and this seemed like a perfect case to uh, really make headway in the state of Maryland, especially being a bastion of new social experiments, a way to take back some ground in, in terms of economic liberty. This was a grassroots movement that really came into its own after the 2018 Farm Bill was passed. And it shows that once that legal restriction was terminated, people are ingenious and they come up with products that are just as good in every way, that are just as effective, that are just as safe, and that are cost less. And that's what competition should be about. Derek Spruill is the owner of Cherry Blossom Hemp and a board member for the Maryland Healthy Alternatives Association and Maryland Hemp Coalition. He has been in the cannabis world for most of his life and is a true believer in both the economic potential for small businesses and the medicinal application of hemp products. Hemp gave small business people, people who had little resources, an opportunity to step into this arena and show what kind of contributions that they could make. A lot of us did very good. Most of us played by the rules. Most of us did exactly what we were supposed to do. In any space, there's gonna be bad actors, of course, right? All the things you've ever been taught about America is that every person has the opportunity to get off the couch and push themselves to go do whatever they want, you know, to be whatever they wanna be, to expand their business and their ideas and their concepts as far as they can go. And if you look at what hemp industry has done nationwide, unbelievably American, and all the things your grandfather taught you about Americanism and economy and, and like building, starting from nothing and pulling yourself up by your boots, the hemp industry has done. They have done it. The industry is so big that there's no way that we can ever go back from here without talking about Prohibition 2.0, Reefer Madness 2.0. The cat is out of the bag. And what's happened with, with the legalization of hemp, these massive cannabis behemoths, these goliaths of cannabis are very angry that a free market for hemp products exists because now it's showing the world that we don't have to be so afraid of cannabis legalization and we don't have to over-regulate it the way that we're doing it. And in these limited license and over-regulated markets, you have these islands that are created by these large cannabis companies where they're the ones who can afford to meet the regulations. They're the ones who can afford to build out these massive uh, facilities. They're the ones who can afford to do these things. So they wanna keep that market small. And these large cannabis companies will then wield political influence in the form of massive campaign contributions and collusion with certain elected officials or, or, or government agencies in charge of regulating cannabis to craft cannabis policy in a way that favors these massive corporations to the detriment of both the public and the small business community. A new economic impact report from Whitney Economics underscores the significant growth of Maryland's hemp industry with impressive figures, such as over $300 million in retail sales, the creation of more than 4,200 jobs, and over $160 million in wages supported by the Maryland hemp industry. It is precisely this burgeoning success that has drawn the attention of large cannabis companies. These companies, feeling threatened by the hemp industry's rapid expansion, have been covertly working with state regulators. Through extensive misinformation campaigns, they aim to influence policies in a way that could devastate the hemp industry permanently. It is simply a money grab, and it's one that's been engineered for years before it ever came to the forefront. Daniel Simmons is the CEO of Georgetown Hemp and an international wholesaler and distributor of various CBD and Delta E products. An expert in the therapeutic use of cannabinoids, Simmons is committed to the ethical, organic, and affordable use of effective plant medicine by the sick and suffering. He's a market leader in helping establish industry best practices and works with other cannabis business leaders and scientists worldwide to educate policymakers and consumers. He believes that the hemp industry in Maryland is being unfairly targeted 
in an attempt to further consolidate the cannabis industry. My store had about five medical marijuana dispensaries within two miles. They all shopped at my store, the managers. They held their team building events at my store. You had access to more components from the cannabis plant at Georgetown Hemp than you did at any Maryland dispensary. And practical uh, applications as how to use these effectively. That it's just so hypocritical that we weren't called on when all of the sudden they decide that these constituents need regulating. We are the ones that offered the help and were just shown the door. During the 2022 legislative session, the General Assembly attempted to ban hemp products like Delta 8 THC and other federally legal hemp products. After a huge backlash from the MHAA, that bill was converted into a summer study group to study these hemp compounds and make recommendations to the General Assembly. Levi Sellers and Daniel Simmons were the only hemp industry participants in the study group. It was really due to motivation from Nicholas, my friend and, and colleague. I felt a responsibility to stand up for the industry because really there weren't a whole lot of people who, A, we would have been credible enough and tenured enough to take that lead. And we hopped on the phones that first day we got together. Within two days, we had raised like 30, 50 grand. You know, I said, let's hire a lobbyist. We hired a lobbyist. We did a, a press blitz and we got a response from Senator Feldman within a matter of days. Okay, let's slow this down. Call the dogs off, he said. Let's talk about this. We, we weren't aware. We thought in good faith at that point that we were now being granted, let's not call it a seat at the table, but maybe like a bar stool to lean on where we could at least get a few words in. Little did we know it was far from the case. The summer study created by the Maryland General Assembly seemed like a decision made in good faith to consider the needs of small businesses. However, the study was conducted by the Maryland Medical Cannabis Commission and was heavily weighted against the hemp industry. Throughout the study, the hemp industry was painted as being unfavorable towards regulation. This could not have been further from the truth. They realized that the industry was a lot bigger than they had expected. They got a lot of pushback from us, and we were able to take an initial bill in 2022 that aimed to ban all of these products and convert it into a study group. So we make it through one legislative session by the skin of our teeth, essentially with a reprieve after this summer study, which I was appointed to participate in, but turned out as we thought to be incredibly rigged process from the very start. There were only two representatives from the hemp industry, myself and Levi Seller, and we were completely boxed out of the process. We're not privy to any of the methods for collecting information or asked for input at any point. You know, so I'm just hoping that we're given equal opportunity. I know Levi and myself were appointed to represent and consult from, from the hemp industry, but I received an agenda two or three days before this meeting, a pre-established agenda. And in the beginning of the meeting, it was mentioned that there was consult by the hemp industry. Well, you've got two people who were written in the laws to be consulted and, and neither of us was. Why wouldn't you access the resources that you have right in front of you? We, we participated in this study group with the Maryland Medical Cannabis Commission and a whole bunch of other people that never should have been there, like the Maryland Wholesale Cannabis Trade Association. Why were they involved in a meeting related to a study group that has to do with a government agency and the hemp industry? Why do we have an association led by big cannabis uh, individuals involved in something that has to deal with hemp? The hemp industry only had two participants in the study. We were never given an opportunity to contribute to the agenda. We were never given an opportunity to, to give a presentation or, or, or put forward our own experts. None of that. All we were able to do was ask questions. The influence of corporate cannabis and the desire to monopolize the market was made perfectly clear with the passage of the Cannabis Reform Act of 2023. Language in this bill restricts the sale of all hemp products with more than two and a half milligrams of total THC exclusively to the state licensed dispensaries, forcing hemp companies to coalesce and begin lobbying for their right to exist. These hemp companies refused to go down without a fight and began organizing, fundraising, and making their voices heard. Honorable Chair Wilson and members of the committee, my name is Nicholas Patrick and I'm the Vice President of the Maryland Healthy Alternatives Association and the owner of Embrace CBD, which has three locations in Maryland. I stand before you today, or sit, as many would define as a dreamer. I came to this country as a baby and for the majority of my life, I lived in the shadows as an undocumented immigrant until I was 26 years old. I'm more than a dreamer, I'm a doer and a builder. And I'm here today to defend my livelihood and those of the entire hemp industry and their families by offering amendments to this legislation that's outlined in my written testimony. 
greatly concerned that specific language in this bill will be catastrophic to the Maryland hemp industry and could eliminate it completely. Unless amended, this same language conflicts with federal law and could cause the implementation of the adult use cannabis industry to be tied up in unnecessary litigation, further wasting taxpayer dollars and time. This language as written will effectively destroy an extremely diverse and equitable federally protected industry and put hundreds out of business without even consulting the industry or offering any alternatives. This language would in effect outlaw nearly every hemp derived product for sale across our state. There is no need to do this when we have a comprehensive plan for the regulation of these products outlined in HB 1204. It has come to my attention that there are some people in this room working on behalf of the cannabis establishment that have been using political influence to mislead the legislature by spreading misinformation about our industry on behalf of their clients with a competing economic interest. This legislation as written, as written steals opportunity from these small business owners and hands those very same opportunities to the people that already own multi-million dollar businesses, the existing dispensary owners. It defies comprehension that the liberal state of Maryland would allow HB 556 to ironically put 100 or so minority immigrant families out of business for the sake of the wealthy, all the while claiming some sort of social equity. It's not right. It's un-American. And as Maryland business owners, we do expect better. We are not all bad actors. We are legal business people operating by the letter of the law. We simply want to stay in business. Large cannabis operators in this state, in collaboration with out-of-state entities, are actively working with lobbyists to influence legislation that would effectively shut down the Maryland hemp industry to further consolidate the cannabinoid market in their favor. This is evident by the concerning language in this bill, as well as multiple interviews of cannabis operators published in local papers and personal interactions between hemp industry stakeholders and large cannabis operators. Behind me today, you will see many people that are here in support of our industry. Please look at them. These are the men and women whose livelihoods this bill as written will destroy. Think about their families. You have the power to either help them or destroy them. And when you destroy someone's likelihood, that is akin to killing them. That's why we're dressed in black, because we're here to attend a funeral. I know that this is not the intention of this body. Let's work together to create an alternative approach that can help the small business community in the hemp industry and not hurt them. While the hemp industry presented the General Assembly with a plan for the state regulation of hemp products, along with economic impact studies that showed massive numbers and hundreds of pages of written testimony from business owners, scientists, legal professionals, consumers, and hemp industry trade groups, the lobbyists for the monopolists continued to mislead the legislature by stating that hemp products like the ones in question were only made legal due to a federal loophole. These lobbyists work for the largest cannabis companies in the state and across the country. And finally, Madam Chair, uh, to be clear on hemp, we are not interested in banning non-intoxicating hemp products. The only reason this issue is here is not because we chose it to be here. It's because Congress five years ago passed a bill with a big old loophole. Folks drove a truck through it. Congress didn't act. FDA didn't act. No one in this room has ever voted to allow the sale of these products that we're concerned about in Maryland, period. And it's not just Delta 8, it's Delta 9, which is what gets you high. We are concerned about things that get you high and you can walk to Main Street and buy some right after this hearing. So that's what the issue is. Why are we trying to, to, to push cannabis back like we're still in the days of prohibition? None of it makes any sense. And the reason why they're doing that is because these guys, these large cannabis regulators, many of them, when, when they decide to, they leave their posts as regulators and go and take jobs at the highest levels of the very cannabis companies that they were just tasked with regulating. It happened here in Maryland. The, f the, the former uh, director of the Maryland Medical Cannabis Commission now is one of the lead lobbyists for the very companies that she was in charge of regulating. Now that's not illegal. Is it ethical? Because that's what we're seeing. And what's so ironic is the industry that created that ban that, that boxed us out is an industry that is deemed federally illegal. As I mentioned early on, how the Farm Bill was created to be co-managed by the Fed and the state. Here you have a federally illegal product and the commission that governs and regulates it banning a product that is federally legal and doing it by changing definitions and creating language as part of their federally illegal yeah i just have to comment on this one basically what he's saying is that the state is banning the federally legal hemp however they are allowing the federally illegal marijuana which is a controlled substance so it's just like 
<laughs> what is going on here? But yeah, we're just going to continue that. I just wanted to make that point if it wasn't already clear. Recreational bill. J.D. McCormick is the president of the American Help the Alternatives Association and an industry leader. He is a hemp and cannabis policy expert with many years of experience in public policy and lobbying. I have spoken with um, J.D. before on the phone and I asked him, I was like, hey, J.D., how much would it cost to literally do a lawsuit in every state to keep hemp legal? And he's like, eh, it'd be a bit about like 300000 to $500,000 per state. So if we could somehow raise three hundred to five hundred k in uh, money to the Healthy Alternatives Association, we could keep hemp legal in every state. <laughs> so I don't know if that would be possible to crowdfund that, but that is that is a theoretical possibility, guys. To keep weed legal, keep it legal. It's already legal. Anyways, let's continue. He is currently involved in more than a dozen states and educating lawmakers and working to craft hemp legislation that is favorable to both public safety and small businesses. He is highly regarded as one of the most influential players in the hemp industry nationwide. I think one of the hardest things I have to deal with in my advocacy efforts is watching the blood, sweat, and tears, often from years of hard work, being destroyed by misinformed, misinterpreted, misrepresented narratives and legislation, watching someone's livelihood be ripped away from them by misinformation and narratives and spin. And it is quite honestly, one of the hardest things I have to deal with. Embrace CBD owner Nicholas Patrick says he knew this day was coming after lawmakers in Annapolis greenlit the plan setting up Maryland's legalization of recreational pot. Language in the law prevents most of the products that used to sit on these now empty shelves from being sold. It's because the hemp products like Delta 8 have THC in it, but it's not the same THC that you think of when you think of someone smoking weed. We began letting all of our customers know that come July 1st, we will no longer be able to sell these products we're still sitting on i think at this point i, th I have about thirty five thousand dollars worth of inventory that i can't sell now layoffs and financial ruin may be on the horizon for patrick his family and staff members we're devastated i'm i'm devastated i may have to file bankruptcy after two years of lobbying educating lawmakers, fundraising, consulting with legal analysts and economists, and fighting for their industry, the Canada's Reform Act of 2023 passed with overwhelming support, which still included language that gutted the hemp industry from top to bottom. Discouraged, but not defeated, the industry decided to pursue a legal strategy. And this crony capitalism, um, you know, behind closed doors with the heads of these commissions who are just looking to further their careers. They're all pushing for future positions and appointments at state and federal levels. And the, the writing was on the wall. They just let us feel like they were interested in our input. We didn't know that we were gonna have to deal with all this legislative drama and all the, these legal battles. We had no intention of getting involved in any of this. We just were building a small business. And our story is a story of hundreds of other uh, Marylanders and now many thousands across the country as similar battles are played out in other states where small businesses with a small piece of the cannabis industry are being eaten alive by large cannabis companies using state legislatures as a tool to crush their competitors with a competing economic interest. And so I look at all of this and I say, it's time somebody stood up to it. And that's where our lawsuit came from. Now leaders in the hemp industry in Maryland are done fighting to keep that's their so businesses sick. open, despite Maryland's new law prohibiting the sale of some production without a cannabis license. It's a story Fox 45's Mackenzie Frost has been following for months. And Mackenzie joins us live right now with the new legal step that's being taken, Mackenzie. Yeah, Kai, the Maryland Hemp Coalition is suing the state, arguing Maryland is monopolizing the marijuana licensing industry and therefore hurting hemp businesses. Maryland Hemp Coalition is behind the suit, along with Spruill, farmers like Levi Sellers at South Mountain Microfarm, and others. So my clients who have been lawfully selling these products for years are suddenly in a position where they are being told they can't sell their products uh, without a license, and yet 
the obstacles to getting a license are nearly insurmountable. Nevin Young, the attorney representing the hemp businesses, he argues the state is monopolizing the pot licenses. I think the law is clearly uh, irrationally restricting the number of licenses. The lawsuit also claims the license lottery system is discriminatory. Round one, geared towards social equity applicants, defined by the state as people living in areas disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. Young argues politics and money played a role when crafting pot policy. As soon as a lot of money gets on the table, um, a lot of our elected officials seem to forget about those basic principles. Especially since carve-outs were introduced in Annapolis, creating regulation and testing in the hemp industry, all to ensure product safety. That plan eventually died in committee. Meanwhile, the lawsuit's starting what's expected to be a lengthy process, and those with a stake in the outcome are looking to stay afloat. We're investigating options of moving our facilities and production out of the state. Uh, into another state, which could potentially cost my farm hundreds of thousands of dollars um, to move, as well as uh, could potentially lose the whole farm in the process. The lawsuit seeking to put a temporary stop to the laws enforcing the ban on these hemp products. Because that was what they were telling us to do, we had to get a license. Okay. And then we stumbled upon some very interesting things. We saw, number one, the artificial limit on these licenses. 300 dispensary licenses. We have thousands of alcohol licenses, 300 dispensary licenses, a handful of grow licenses, a handful of processing licenses, and a, and a social equity criteria that has no rational relationship to any sort of social justice or uh, restorative justice or any sort of attempt at actually righting the wrongs caused by cannabis criminalization. There's, it, it's all a smokescreen, it's a farce. As the first chapter of our journey through the tumultuous cannabis landscape of Maryland comes to a close, the stories of these business owners and others echo the voices of many, standing at the front lines of a fight, not just for economic survival, but for the very soul of an industry. We're not standing here selfishly like, my business, my business, my business. No, we're not here fighting for your business, man. You know, for your opportunity, for your family. And we need your contributions. The Maryland Healthy Alternative Association, as well as the Maryland Hemp Coalition. In any way you can, please support the Maryland Hemp Coalition and the Maryland Healthy Alternatives Association so that we can continue to protect small family-owned and minority-owned businesses operating in the cannabis trade. If there's anything you guys take from this, it's that we've been your warriors in the front lines and we've bootstrapped so much of this because we're passionate and we believe in it, but we really now more than ever need your help and support. HealthyAlternativesMD.org. Please donate. Please visit the website. Look what we're involved in and participate. It's time for us to stand up for what's right here. And so we're asking you for your support to go to www.HealthyAlternativesMD.org and donate to our cause. Help us get this lawsuit across the finish line. Help us make history in Maryland cannabis and national cannabis. Help us advocate for a complete paradigm shift in cannabis policy across the country. In part two, we'll dive deeper into the underbelly of this conflict, uncovering the stories of those who've been swept aside by the tidal wave of legislation. Stay with us as the fight for free markets and fair play continues in Maryland's Canada Soccer. Well, that was very interesting, wasn't it? So, yeah, probably most of you watching this won't really give a crap. Um, you're just like, I might go to the dispensary and buy my weed or buy from the black market and like not really care about all this stuff, um, which, you know, you really should care because if you're buying from the black market, it could be contaminated um, with bad in, uh, you know, adulterants, pesticides, or if you're buying from the dispensary, you're probably... Um, paying way too much for the product and you are supporting an un-American system. Um, so one thing that I've been working with uh, Nick Patrick on is getting him on some podcasts to spread the word about this documentary and this issue and to help him raise some funds. So if you do decide to donate to healthyalternativesmd.com, um, just know that, you know, when they win that lawsuit with enough funds given, hopefully, um, that is a process that can be duplicated in every state. And as we get him on this podcast run, um, I'm working with uh, some media companies to get him on some huge names, hopefully. Um, 
um, God willing, you know, to spread the word about this. And uh, hopefully we can bring the cannabis industry into a better direction. So hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure you follow Healthy Alternatives MD down below. I'm going to put the link to the actual documentary. Like, this is the actual documentary that we just watched, but, like, his, uh, Nick Patrick's um, organization, the Healthy Alternatives MD YouTube channel that hosts the original content. This is just a reaction, whatever. We basically just watched it. <laughs> so, anyways, cheers. Have a great night.